All right, welcome back to the Kitchen Research Group. Today I'm going to talk about degree of rate control and sensitivity analysis by automatic differentiation. I talked about this paper uh, once before, but this is a talk I gave at the re recent North American Catalysis Society meeting, and I thought I would just uh, put it here so that you can see uh, what we've been working on and how it works. So this work was um, done by Siddhartha Char and Yilin Yang. Uh, they, they did uh, most of the analysis that I'll talk about. All right, so what is degree of rate control? Why do we care about it? Um, what I show on the right here is a uh, mechanism, uh, 17 steps for the partial oxidation of propylene. And what you can see uh, here is we have different species uh, in here. There's oxygens, there's different reactions, there's different activation energies, uh, and different pre-exponential factors. And the question now is, which of these steps are rate determining, or today we would call them kinetically relevant, and how do we find it out? It's not always the step with the largest barrier, and that's because you see that we have orders of magnitude variation in some of the pre-exponential factors, and we don't know what the coverages are. And so to figure this out, we need a, a way of calculating how sensitive the overall rate is to any one of these uh, reactions. Now, each of these uh, reactions has this activation energy and this pre-exponential factor. And what we'll focus on is, uh, is the intermediates. That is, if we could stabilize or destabilize an intermediate, how, do we, um, how does that affect the, the overall rates? All right, so the, the degree of rate control uh, is a very powerful tool. Um, Charlie Campbell wrote about it in, in this recent paper and um, uh, Adi Chaban uh, at Minnesota talked about it in, in this paper here. And the idea is that we, we need an expression for the, the log rate, it's convenient to do that. And then we take the partial derivative of the log rate with respect to uh, the free energy of some species. And th there are a couple of different kinds of um, degree of rate control, but uh, I think we'll focus on this one today. And the idea here is that the DRC is, is normalized. Uh, that's why, why we have log rate here, is really the partial derivative of the rate divided by the rate. And we can use this to determine the sensitivity. So if the DRC is equal to zero, that means the rate doesn't change when you change that parameter. And if it's one, that means the rate would go up if the parameter goes up. And minus one means the rate would go down if the parameter goes up. And so it, it seems simple. All we need are some derivatives and that are defined up here. But if you look at this simple two-step reaction, the reaction rate uh, as a function of time has this very complicated form. And you can work out the derivatives. It's just the chain rule after chain rule after chain rule but it's tedious and you can see you have to have the analytical form of the rate law to do that. And there is no analytical form for the rate law in the example I showed you before. Uh, and so what people have done is resort to finite differences to approximate the derivatives and that's also tedious and, and difficult. All right, so the paradigm shift that I'm gonna talk about today is automatic differentiation which is a method that came out of machine learning and it provides us with the ability to differentiate programs. And these are equivalent to analytical derivatives. There's no approximation and we don't have to derive them. So to, just to give you a kind of an idea, let's say we have this program y equals log 3x1 minus 2x2 plus x1 x2. And over on the left you can see a, um, a graph uh, representation of that and if we start here and work our way backwards we can apply the chain rule uh, as we go. So over on the right here is a table that kind of shows um, what we do. We, we sp specify some variables say w1 is x1 and then w1 dot is equal to 1, w2 is equal to x2, w2 dot is equal to 0. We're here we're taking the derivative with respect to x1 and then as we go to w3, that's going to be 3 times w1, so uh, we can get to the derivatives here. And you just keep working your way backwards through the graph, and eventually you find out that the derivative you want is down here at the bottom. Uh, and the beauty of this is the computer does all of this work, not us. And so as long as you have a differentiable program, 
then you can use automatic differentiation to get those derivatives. And that works through loops, through numerical integrators, through nonlinear algebraic equation solvers, um, and things like that. So that's what I'm going to use today to show you uh, how it works. Okay, so automatic differentiation is really changing scientific software today uh, everywhere you look. The, the biggest application by far is machine learning. Uh, it is where the gradient and gradient descent comes from, and it's how all of the training is done in machine learning. But it's used increasingly in optimization. That's, that's actually what machine learning uses it for, to get gradients, Jacobians, Hessians for speeding up uh, different, uh, different algorithms. We've used it a lot in my group in molecular simulation for fitting and calculating forces, uh, for getting the Hessian for vibrational modes, um, and using it to accelerate geometry optimization, coming back up to these points here. And we've also done some work with sensitivity analysis and uncertainty quantification. Both of those methods require lots of derivatives and Hessians and Jacobians uh, to get them. But we've seen uh, other applications in system properties that are derivatives. For example, heat capacity is the derivative of, of um, energy uh, with respect to either um, at constant volume or constant pressure with respect to temperature. And anywhere else you need um, gradients, Jacobian, Hessian, etc. All of these you get by automatic differentiation of programs. Okay, so let's look at our, back at our simple example. Um, we had this two-step reaction, A goes to A adsorbed, A adsorbed plus B goes to C. We had this analytical expression for the rate, which is uh, con convenient to have. And what we can do is write a function that is a wrapper around this that takes log k's as inputs. And then we solve it to get um, the transient behavior. Then we compute the log rate that happens down here. And then in the final step, we have one line to get the forward Jacobian of the rate wrapper with respect to log kf. And so this gives us the derivative d log r, d log kf, and all we have to do then is plot it. So it's very straightforward uh, as long as we can write functions that we can take derivatives of the output with respect to inputs. All right, and here we can see the results. The figure here on the right shows the DRC calculated for uh, reactions one and two um, from an analytical formula, which is exact, and the automatic differentiation formulas, which are um, not derived, but equivalent, as you can see, to the analytical results. So there's no finite differences here, no, um, no approximation to the derivatives. The only approximation we've made is in the numerical integrator, um, and that you can control uh, pretty easily. Now, I will say here, uh, there is a little bit of conservation of effort here. In this problem, you could have sat down, slogged through the derivation of those derivatives and the implementation of those derivatives, and uh, clearly that's what we did for the dark blue and the dark black lines. And the it's also worth noting in, this, uh, in that previous slide, that code example was written in Julia. And the reason is pretty straightforward. Julia had a numerical integrator that was stable and differentiable, uh, and that comes up later. So not all functions turn out to be differentiable. Um, if you use uh, many functions in SciPy, they're not differentiable out of the box uh, without some effort. So there's a little conservation of effort here in learning a new way to solve an old problem and uh, just solving the old problem. Now the payoff is going to come uh, here in a minute when we don't have analytical solutions. All right, so let's take a look at this more complicated, uh, now we'll look at a steady state example for the water gas shift reaction. So now we have seven steps. We have an overall rate of, of hydrogen production, and you can see we have some thetas. These are the coverages that we need to be able to solve for. And so typically what one does is set up mole balances on each species. You get a set of nonlinear coupled algebraic equations, you solve them using some nonlinear iterative solver to get all of those coverages. And then we need to uh, compute that log rate, uh, d log rate, d log uh, g over, over rt. Now the problem with this is we don't have an analytical solution for the thetas. We only have numerical solutions. But it turns out we can get the derivatives that we need um, anyway. So if, if we have our set of equations, capital F, that depend on thetas and k's equal to zero, 
then we can take the derivative of f with respect to k, for example, and we know the thetas depend on k. So we end up getting df d theta d theta dk plus df dk, and now we can get df dk and um, df d theta from automatic differentiation of this expression, and then we just solve for d theta dk. So it turns out to be really straightforward to get the uh, derivatives of theta with respect to k uh, just by this implicit derivative formula. So everything on the right here we can evaluate by automatic differentiation. And I've been a little loose with the notation. This is actually a Jacobian and you multiply it by the inverse of the Jacobian rather than dividing by, uh, by the Jacobian itself. Okay, but once you do that, what we find out is uh, only one step in this whole whole reaction of the seven is kinetically relevant under these conditions, and that is the OH dissociation. And the rest of the steps don't really have a big effect. Um, this one is, is small compared to this one. So that means we now know that we have to um, reduce the barrier of step four if we want to get uh, a higher reaction rate, and that is the OH dissociation barrier. So. Automatic differentiation made this very straightforward to do even when we didn't have that analytical solution. Let's go back to the example I uh, showed in the very beginning, the 17 step reaction. And we can write uh, the rate of propylene oxide in terms of these uh, elementary steps uh, from up here. But again, we have all these coverages and uh, we don't have analytical solutions for them. And in this case, we're going to um, do the same thing that we did before and we set up a mole balance on each species we solve it with a nonlinear solver evaluate the derivatives with automatic differentiation and the results are shown over here on the right and what you can see here is that uh, step 17 is is very negative that's the inverse of oxygen activation so we need a catalyst that can activate oxygen uh, very well in this case and we don't have that in, in here and then step 14 is uh, propylene oxide desorption. So this one uh, is also uh, rate limiting and you can see there's a fairly high barrier. So if we could reduce the barrier for, for propylene oxidation uh, desorption, we would probably get a better rate. And finally, we have propylene adsorption is, uh, is weak and so we need uh, to increase the propylene adsorption. Right, so there are three steps in here that are kinetically relevant that could be used to improve it, and the analysis points us straight to them. The rest of these steps are probably in quasi-equilibrium, and we don't uh, really have much control over those. All right, there's one more thing we can do, and that is there's always uncertainty in those parameters. And if there's uncertainty in the parameters, there will be uncertainty in the DRC, and that's because we're taking the derivative with respect to it. So DELSA is a distributed evaluation of local sensitivity analysis, and it tells us like, if there's a distribution of, of the rate constants, for example, how sensitive is the uh, overall observation to that? And what we want is to see that um, everything stays, say, at zero um, over here, and not, um, not this case here where we have some are zero and some are one. And so what this tells us is that this step 14 is sometimes important and sometimes not um, when we evaluate these uh, derivatives over here. Again, we do this with um, automatic differentiation. So we need to be really sure about the value of K14 because for some values, again, it matters and, and for others, it's much less important. All right, let me finish up a little bit um, talking about why this is the way to do it instead of finite differences. And that this is really illustrated on the right. These goldish uh, yellow curves are by finite difference. And you can see, especially in this one, it's very noisy. If you have too small of a step, that's because you run into precision limits. And it's also noisy uh, here, it's unstable if you use too large of a finite difference step. And you have to spend the time figuring out what is a reasonable uh, compromise on accuracy and, uh, and precision in choosing this step. Where with automatic differentiation, all you need to do is run it because it's practically equivalent to the analytical solutions. So automatic differentiation is faster, it's more accurate, it's better. Um, you do have to learn how to write the code and how to use the code to do the automatic differentiation. Um, but the payoff is quite high uh, in terms of what's possible. 
All right, if you want to learn more about automatic differentiation, um, we've written a book here at Point Breeze uh, Publications, and it is on automatic differentiation and scientific programming using uh, JAX. So this paper we wrote all in uh, Julia because it had a very good numerical integrator for solving the stiff ODEs. Now there are options available in Python where you could do the same thing, and going forward, um, we would probably focus on using Python. All right, so uh, you can check out uh, Point Breeze pubs to find that, and you can also see uh, a video about automatic differentiation on YouTube, and uh, my, my YouTube channel in general has lots of, of Python programming um, goodness. All right, so I'll conclude. We used automatic differentiation implemented in Julia to perform the degree of rate control and sensitivity analysis. It is faster and more accurate than finite difference approximations, and we can do uh, DRC and sensitivity analysis in systems where there is no analytical solution for the overall rate. We can uh, do automatic differentiation in lots of, of implementations. In Python, uh, you have PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, we have languages with automatic differentiation as well that would be able to do probably many of the same things. Um, I will say these implementations don't uniformly support automatic differentiation across the languages. So for example, not all of SciPy is differentiable, um, but a good bit of um, the, the most common parts, and at least with JAX and, and probably with TensorFlow are. And um, with Julia, you'll have to find out you know what parts of the language are supported, and especially with third-party packages, um, if and how they're supported. Uh, for example, anything that calls out to a C library or a Fortran library is unlikely to support automatic differentiation without some effort. Um, we used Julia in this work, again, just because it had an implementation of a numerical integrator that could solve a stiff problem and was differentiable. Uh, but this is not provided in all the packages, so at the time we wrote the paper, it wasn't provided in, in PyTorch, and like I said, now uh, it is. And not in PyTorch, but in a, another third-party integrator. And finally, uh, I'll leave with automatic differentiation is really changing scientific programming. Um, we, we can now write programs that use derivatives natively and uh, that are equivalent to uh, the analytical forms without needing to derive and implement them. And I think it's, it's really time to start changing how we write programs and how we think about it. All right, that's it. Thanks for coming, and uh, I'll leave a link to the slides in the description. Uh, come back another day.